Hey everyone, on today's edition of The Final Bar, I was all queued up to talk about the market rallying for another day going into the close, and then we gave most of it back in the last 15, 20 minutes, really selling off, showing some distribution, some profit taking into the close. So today we're doing a wrap the week segment. We're going to try to make sense of this week's overall appreciation relative to the long term sort of bearish phase that I feel that we're still trudging our way through. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining me every weekday after the close to make sense of the market environment, try to connect the short-term movements of today and on a Friday of this whole week with the longer-term trends. So by any measure, this, uh, this day and this week has been recovery mode, right? After uh, showing some weakness going into Monday, most of the week felt like we were chipping our way Higher gave a little bit of a back here at the end of uh, at the end of Friday, but overall still a fairly positive trend. You know there are a lot of ways to try to make sense of this environment. We're going to hit on a number of those. You know we talked about uh, the breadth thrusts yesterday, so we're going to revisit that just a little bit. Look at the breadth picture from a couple different angles. And part of the wrap the week segment that I love to do on a Friday is look at the Mindful Investor ch uh, live chart list and really uh, take a step back, look at sentiment, look at breadth, look at trend. Just try to understand where things are uh, headed, prepare ourselves for next week. A lot of great guests on this show and elsewhere on Stock Charts TV in the coming weeks to really help us get our head around what's going on. On Monday, on Behind the Charts, we have Jonathan Krinsky. Uh, he's at Baycrest Partners in the New York area. Uh, we also have then Mark Newton on Tuesday from Newton Advisors. Ari Wall from Oppenheimer. JC O'Hara from MKM Partners uh, in New York. And then Harry Boxer. On April 7th, so we've got some, I feel like we're bringing in the big guns. We're bringing in some fantastic guests this week and the next couple of weeks. So we're excited to get some of their perspectives in front of you. And what's great is, uh, you know, these people that we're bringing in for the most part, these are the ones that the pros are talking to day to day just to try to, you know, get their take on things. So should be good. Also, just want to remind you one more thing. Tomorrow, the Chart Summit is going on. This is put on by JC Peretz at All Star Charts. I'll be speaking at 2 o'clock Eastern Go to chartsummit.com if you're not familiar, if you uh, want to enroll in that, uh, in that one day free event. So let's recap the markets, do our market recap segment. And again, on Friday, it's good to just sort of debrief on where we're at. I just want to start today with the five day chart of the S&P 500. So this is looking Monday through Friday. It's a great way to just visualize where, we, where we've come from. So Monday, you know, I remember at the end of the day, Monday, it felt sort of negative, right? We're sort of chopping around, we're making new lows, and it felt like, okay, another week of further downside. Then, as you know, there have been a lot of, you know, of course, macro influences this week. You've got, you know, action by the Fed that we're still sort of digesting, the presidential, you know, daily press conferences, uh, the stimulus package getting through Congress today uh, and, uh, and this week, and every one of those little bullet points, you know, has materially moved stocks in one way or in another. And for most of this week, it was, uh, it was a sense of appreciation. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, nice chipping away, higher highs, higher lows on the five minute chart here to sort of continue this uptrend. I think that sort of changed today where you opened lower, which was a little different. We haven't opened lower like that in a couple of days. So it felt like a bit of a gap down, a bit of a digestion move. We almost got to yesterday's close and then turned around and gave up all of the day's gains in the last, uh, in the last half hour, essentially. So as we've talked about, that last 30 minutes is really when a lot of things happen. That's a rebalancing time. That's when big institutions will probably move volume. It's also a lot of ETFs that need to make adjustments will do so. And so, you know, the negative move that we see in stocks, you know, in general, you can't really consider that being, in my opinion, anything but more negative than positive. That distribution is telling you for whatever reason um, that, uh, that they're selling. There's more sellers than buyers at that point or more selling uh, pressure than buying power, if you, uh, you know, to put it a different way. So overall, finishing the week a little bit on a weaker note, but overall, the trend has been positive. And looking at a daily chart of the S&P, uh, you know, you can see, and this isn't quite updated for the close, we kind of got back down to 
uh, more toward the lows. There we go. But, you know, overall, this is this week, sort of, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday. So directionally, pretty big week. And if we look at a weekly chart, it might be a little hard to see, but that far right sort of green candle, it's called an outside week. So that's where, um, you know, from bar chart analysis, it's where you have higher high and higher low from the previous week, but we've closed toward the upper end of that uh, range. That's usually means a uh, short-term bullish bias. If you'd uh, look at a candle chart of this, this is a bullish engulfing pattern. So, you know, again, by, by any measure, this up move has certainly been a sign of strength. And I think uh, to wrap up that sort of quick analysis, this bullish divergence, I think you can't deny that that's uh, you know, sort of confirmed, right? So we had the you know, higher lows in the RSI with the lower lows in the price. We've broken above that sort of midpoint, that swing uh, high. And I think at this point, you know, short term, the trend feels a little more positive than negative. Again, my concern is still the overall trajectory. All of my guests this week, I've tried to ask them about short term versus long term. And they've certainly given the sense more on, uh, you know, we're at the early stages of a bottoming process, but the bottoming process has begun in some way. So just wrapping up today's trading before we get into more of a, a longer term analysis, the S&P actually finished down over three and a third percent down to settle in just above 2540. Uh, mid caps down about the same three and a, uh, 330 basis points, small caps down the most. So it really felt distribution going into the close from the more speculative, more higher beta uh, part of the market. That sell off pushed the VIX up to about 65. And again, still very elevated relative to historical trends. We've had some interesting sector uh, relationships in the last couple of weeks. And, and a lot of times yesterday, if I remember right, you know, the market up, but it was defensive groups like Utes and real estate at the top. Today, it was really more of a defensive list. If I list the sectors in order from most defensive to least defensive, it wouldn't probably be far off from this list, I would guess, with a couple movements. But overall, use real estate staples would be one, two, three uh, at the top. And that's how things sort of played out. So certainly today was a bit more of a uh, digestion, a bit more of a flight to safety uh, leading into the weekend. And again, it's not, you know, you'd, you'd love to finish the week feeling like a big uptrend to finish in a position of strength. We didn't get that, folks. We sort of uh, finished into a period of weakness. Um, in terms of global markets, pretty much everything down today. The uh, U.S. markets were one of the stronger ones, sort of down the least. Um, Japan was the only one that was sort of flat. Uh, the things that were down the most, uh, you know, a lot related to energy. So you have Brazil, Australia, um, Mexico, um, and, uh, and China down uh, over 6% today. Uh, EM as a whole struggling. We're going to look in a bit, I think, hopefully if we have time on uh, emerging markets, their relative performance, but really have, uh, have been struggling here recently. In terms of industry leadership, you'll notice a lot of real estate, a lot of utilities in the top 10 list. Um, you know, we had David Auerbach uh, on last week talking about REITs and interesting to see some of those groups actually holding up beautifully. Look at residential REITs. They're coming up four straight uh, up days, right, coming out of the lows, which isn't bad and finished up strong today at a time when most things were actually uh, struggling a little bit. Um, you also have only one group within, two groups within consumer uh, staples. Tires is, a, is sort of a tiny rounding error. So I just wanted to point out non-durable household products. And you also had a number of utilities represented here. On the downside, you had a bunch of uh, sectors or a bunch of industries that were down big. And it's the more, um, you know, recovery stories that struggle the most. So airlines, travel and tourism, gambling, recreation services. Um, these are all sort of the uh, recovery names, right? Things that would uh, you would expect uh, benefiting from a bailout package are the ones that were down big. So airlines not really feeling the love today. Uh, a weight on the uh, the overall market. That's why industrials overall relatively weak, and then plenty of, of uh, energy as well with oil struggling. Integrated oils, those are the big big names, Chevron, Chevron and uh, and Exxon and others, sort of at the bottom of the list. So you know, certainly to wrap up today's movement, you know, it, it I and as always, I, I feel like doing this show after the close is just a challenge because the last thirty minutes have dramatically changed the picture so many times. I'm almost surprised when it doesn't happen. And today was no different. I'm on the uh, call getting ready with my producer. And as we're talking, the market just starts uh, coming off there. So certainly a lot of profit taking. And I think leading into the weekend, when I'm looking at individual charts, I'm going to be spending a lot of time looking at today's sort of close and how that lines up to, uh, to things. That gets us to our next segment, Wrap the Week. And again, every Friday we love to do is take a step back, look at the longer term charts, try to make, try to make sense of how this week fits into the big picture. And what I like to use for this 
is what we call the Mindful Investor Live Chartlist. This is the chartlist I started to be a companion to my blog called The Mindful Investor. If you've not seen this before, it's no problem. You click on the Articles tab at the top. On the upper right, it has all of our blogs listed out. Just go to mine, which is called The Mindful Investor. And at the very top, you're gonna see this link called Live Chartlist. It's gonna bring you to the list of charts that you're seeing here. You can click on a button at the top of the screen, just save it to your own login. Then you'll have these to, uh, to review anytime you want. So we're gonna start with a broad picture of the S&P. This is a weekly chart going back for five years. This is using a trend following model that I've used uh, for, uh, for many years. Um, it has a couple different components to it. Uh, the, the one is a very long-term component using the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages. This just turned negative uh, this week. And so now that we've locked in the close on Friday, even though we rallied into, you know, into today's trading, Overall, this is confirming finally getting this downtrend in stocks. It's using longer term weekly exponential averages. So it takes a little longer to, uh, to react and that's on purpose. It's, it's meant to minimize as many whipsaws as possible, but uh, has just turned negative. So overall suggesting the longer term trend now uh, more negative than positive. The last time it was in that configuration was the uh, you know, December 18 to February 19 period, which ended up obviously recovering and that turned positive a couple months later. The more tactical side, the shorter term part of this, which is really more of a medium term read, is this uh, weekly PPO. This is using the traditional settings of the MACD and PPO indicators, very similar. And so turn negative the second week in February has remained uh, negative in, in some ways, extremely negative because it's going uh, so far to the downside. And, uh, and you can see the momentum there, those green bars that are illustrating that. But overall has remained in a, a negative uh, trends suggesting now the short term and long term trends still uh, on the negative side. Daily chart of the S&P we've talked about and again the, the the takeaway I'm looking at is we're in short term. I, I, I see this as a short term tactical bull move, but still within a long term downtrend. I still think we're going to see uh, further downside, a, a, a test of the lows if not uh, lower. I actually mentioned earlier I tweeted I, I think we'll see 2300 before we see 2800. We'll see one of those maybe hit next week, even Monday. So hopefully we got a little time to see how that plays out. But that, that's sort of my expectation. I still feel, think we, we have a lot more uh, to digest. It's a process that I can't imagine would be over just yet. This is our next chart looking at uh, daily breadth readings using the cumulative advanced decline lines. And what I like to do is use this as a way of measuring you know, cap tier performance, looking at the larger versus the smaller companies within uh, the equity space in the U.S., but also just to check on the overall market trends. So the, the chart of the S&P does uh, one thing. What is the breadth telling us? And this is not updated yet through today's close. This is going through yesterday. We certainly had an uptick in these cumulative breadth ratings. You can see across the board, they've gone higher. And this is large caps based on the S&P at the top. This is the small cap index at the bottom. But again, what strikes me with these is I still think they're in a downtrend overall, even with uh, you know the, this week so far sort of turning higher. The real kicker is when you get a higher low. And so on this next pullback, are we able to establish higher lows in the S&P, but especially in these cumulative breadth readings? So overall saying, you know, recognizing the uptrend, but not quite signaling a, uh, a downtrend. A lot, of the, uh, a lot of the other breadth readings are still, you know, overall fairly negative. It, um, they haven't updated a ton since we got these really bombed out breadth readings. And this pattern with uh, new lows going to extremes with, you know, percent of stocks above their 200 day going to very low extremes. This is what has um, helped me make sense of this sell off and think of it a lot less like the 2015 16 market and more like the 2008 2009 market. And again, I feel like the leg we're in is kind of coming out of those 2008 lows in October ish before we broke down and hit the, the, the ultimate low. Uh, in the first quarter of 2019. I feel like we're sort of between those two pot potentially now uh, with another retest, another sort of pullback that, that could end up being a very viable uh, viable move. You know, updating breadth, I think we missed talking about this yesterday. I tried to remember to talk about this on Thursdays, but uh, sorry, in sentiment is what I, what I meant there. So the AAII ratings are based on individual investors and asking if you're bullish, bearish, or neutral on stocks. And uh, you know, overall, the bearish number has stayed pretty consistent and, and the bullish number has come down just a little bit from last week, but overall pretty decent. I mean, a third of the respondents still saying um, that they're bullish on stocks and that hasn't come down a ton. Now, before it was about 40, it was about 45%. So we're down, 
you know, 12, 13% from that. So granted that is coming down, but I would expect this to be a lot lower given how much we've sold off. And if you look back at, you know, sort of the uh, 2015, 16 period, this bullish reading will get down to 20%, if not even a little lower, which is more what I would expect. So, you know, the, the bulls have not come off. There's still a lot of uh, underlying optimism about stocks that's being reflected here. And there haven't been new people voting uh, on the negative side. Um, what's interesting, the difference between those two has remained about 20%, and that's increased a little bit with the decrease in, in uh, bulls this week, but overall, uh, certainly favoring more bearish respondents than bullish. And if you look back, pretty rare that we have over 50% bears. That goes back to some of the uh, historical bear market phases that we've talked about. Looking at some of the ratios, you know, some of these have, have certainly dramatically given what's happened in the market, all the volatility that we've seen. Um, this ratio of consumer staples versus discretionary, um, you know, if this is going up, it's saying discretionary is outperforming, going down, staples outperforming. Um, it's come up a lot. You can see it's come up a lot more on the cap weighted version at the top than the equal weighted version at the bottom. That's because Amazon is a big weight on this top cap weighted version. It's a big weight in the, uh, in the numerator, basically. So Amazon holding up, it's sort of a, you know, coronavirus play because I, you know, I don't know about you, but a lot of people are uh, ordering more than ever on Amazon. You can see Amazon Prime now means uh, a week or two and not a couple days. And, uh, and, and on the equal weighted version, that recovery in Amazon is muted uh, relative to other names. Um, just a couple other quick things I wanted to do because we're almost out of time here. I did want to point out this theme of small cap underperformance has not alleviated. And so, you know, even in a defensive environment uh, versus the offensive environment, small caps have continued to underperform. So, you know, from a technical perspective, I think you'd be hard pressed to justify owning small caps anytime soon, just based on that continued underperformance. The growth story has still been working. And I think, uh, you know, talking with some of my guests this week about uh, Matt Maley in particular, talking about technology yesterday being offense and defense, you see the XLK hold up really nicely on a, uh, on a relative basis. And I think that's part of it. And then the last one is just to illustrate um, the dollar has weakened significantly in the last week. This has led the U.S. to be underperforming ACWI, underperforming the global equity index. Whether or not this is a pullback and we turn higher, I think it's an interesting chart to be watching uh, right now, along with this one. This is what's really hurting things. This is EM underperforming EFA, so emerging markets underperforming developed markets. And that certainly speaks to the weakness in oil and challenges with a lot of uh, non-U.S. markets on the emerging side. We're going to go right on. That's our weekly wrap. We're going to go right on to our next segment, which is uh, the mailbag. Uh, so our, in our mailbag segment, what we love to do is answer your questions. As a reminder, you can always get questions to us a couple different ways. Best way is via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. Uh, shoot us questions anytime. We get a lot of questions, which we love. Uh, we try to address, address as many questions as we can on the air here. Um, there are two other ways you can get a hold of us. The second is on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. Just give us a follow there and uh, make any comments. Just reply to some of our posts uh, about upcoming guests and shows. We'd love to answer your questions or uh, if you have questions for our guests, that's a great way to, uh, uh, to do it. Or during the show, we have a Q&A panel. Just put in a question there and we'll make a point of grabbing those uh, as much as we can. Let me get up some of these questions again. These questions have all come from you really in the last... 24 to 48 hours. Question number one, I'm interested in undertaking, uh, understanding more about high frequency trading and I thought others might be able to uh, as well. I'm just uh, I'm editing here mentally just a bit. It was in the news today. I thought it would be timely. Uh, as high frequency trading certainly appears to be a, a part of the big price movements uh, lately. It's a really good question and I'm, I'm making a note. I'll talk to our producers about we're, we're working on doing some shorter form uh, quick five, 10 minute videos just explaining some of these concepts. I think high frequency trading would be a perfect uh, example of one of the topics that we can, uh, we can cover in those. Uh, but just the, the short answer uh, is, you know, yes and no. And I guess the yes answer is I have no doubt that high frequency trading has been a part of this. Uh, and, and that is a, 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 a truism. That is just a, a, an accepted part of market liquidity now is the fact that high frequency trading is providing a lot of that liquidity. So when you make a trade, you, you could be paired with, uh, you know, some random firm doing, uh, doing that sort of thing. And uh, there, there are some ways to try to make assumptions as to what's happening. It is impossible to really know where, you know, it, how you're, you're getting filled relative to, you know, who might be on the other side of things. Um, so a lot of it more than often than not is just speculation, but every, 
you know, everyone that I've spoken to over a number of years and all the data that I've seen certainly suggests that it's a, uh, you know, still relatively small, but very much growing part of the daily uh, order flow, in some cases, uh, dramatically bigger part. I don't, you know, I would not say as much high frequency trading. I think a lot of times we group high free, a lot of things into quote unquote high frequency trading. A lot of it are just different, you know, quantitative approaches, hedge funds applying more of a systematic approach. Um, I would say that has certainly impacted things now. So when a market breaks a key level or when you see things dramatically move and it feels like how are things moving that quickly when a system is triggered and enough people have a similar sort of input that's going to cause a real imbalance on uh, on buys versus sells or, you know types of orders that are coming out coming out and i think that's certainly more maybe than high frequency trading i think it's more systematic trading is what i would uh, i would say which can be very short term and it's very related but kind of a little subtle difference so uh, sorry for the long-winded uh, stream of consciousness answer short answer is Certainly that's a part of it. The medium answer is it's a part of it, but I think there are other things that are impacting things that are more systematic quantitative approaches. And the longer answer I will save for a uh, future segment, which I'll look forward to uh, doing or helping one of my other contributors get ready for. Question number two, and thank you for that one. Question number two, oil bottoms but not tops tend to coincide with major and minor stock market bottoms. I believe the only reason oil is currently moving sideways is because of the market's recent rally. That's a really cool question comparing stocks and oil. And I'll give you two sort of answers to that one. Um, you know, question number, or I guess answer number one is a lot of people have tried to draw relationships between crude oil and stocks. And I'll show you one. Uh, Tom McClellan wrote an article on our top advisor's corner uh, last August. So if you look for his name, just look for it. If you Google this, you'll find this article. He actually does analogs where he adjusts the time scale. So his argument is if you look at oil 10 years ago and the movements there, that's going to show you the movements in stocks uh, right now or more currently. Um, you know, again, I think there's a challenge with that um, in that. And again, there are th analogs, I think, like this. And analogs are when you take one data series and overlay it with a different data series. So we do it a lot right now. How to, you know, a, a thing that's circulated with a lot of my friends this week has been looking at the market right now versus the 20, 1929 to 32 period, how are we lining up with that Great Depression, that big 50% rally in the midst of an 89% loss on the, on the, on the Dow? Um, and, and so we love to make those comparisons. A statistician would laugh at you if, you if you said you were looking at one other observation and drawing a conclusion about a second one, they would say there's no statistically significant conclusion you can draw from that. So I would say, number one, I would hesitate. I think it's interesting to see what has happened and know that the markets tend to rhyme. They won't exactly repeat, but they'll rhyme. But I wouldn't draw too many specific conclusions like the market should do X because this other example did X as well. So one of the things I would encourage you to do though is look at charts that allow you to compare two different asset classes effectively. So this is a chart I created looking at the last five years. I have the S&P at the top in blue. I have crude oil in black uh, there. And then the bottom in red is the rolling 20 day correlation between stocks and crude oil. Now, as you can see, just visually, you can see that in general, these have had very similar patterns and some more than others. But if you look at the bottoms in 2015 and 16, if you look at the rallies here in late 2017, if you look at the sell off the fourth quarter of 2018, and if you look at what happened now, oil sold off, you know, before while the market was still in rally mode, and then it kind of came down here. So, you know, visually, it certainly has seemed to be the case. And I'm seeing a lot of similarities there. That's become a little bit disconnected here this week where you've had this rally in stocks and oil has not gone dramatically lower, it's sort of gone sideways, which is sort of to your question. At the bottom here, when you look at the correlation, you can see, and a lot of times, they tend to move in a very similar fashion until they don't. So you'll see times like in mid-2018 where they actually become disconnected, the correlations come down a great deal, and all of a sudden they're not really moving in lockstep as much as they had before. So the same thing here in 2017 when stocks continued higher and they sort of uh, you know, be became disconnected. But overall, the correlation has been stronger more than it's been, uh, been weaker. Um, so there are some charts that could help you visually sort of make those comparisons, and I, I don't disagree with you. There's certainly been a relationship there overall. Uh, I, I certainly get the point. Third question, sorry, we're gonna to have to go very quickly through these, uh, these last ones. Uh, I mentioned the Marty, the Zweig uh, bread thrust yesterday. He was a great contrarian, I completely agree with you. Um, what's the best contrarian chart? That's such a tough one to answer. To be, to be honest with you, I've always tended to favor RSI, and if I had one thing besides price, I would look at the daily RSI and I would look at when it's uh, at its extremes. And you know anything like that, a Z-score or something where you're looking at 
how a stock or a market tends to move versus how it is moving now can be really, uh, can illuminate a lot of extreme moves. And I think this bullish divergence is one of the more telling parts of, of, uh, of this chart that I've, uh, that I've seen. Boy, given our limited time, I'm just gonna answer one more question here. Um, the asset class chart, how did you get them all to start? Yeah, so earlier this week, I showed a chart. I don't know if this, it was this exact one, but it was something kind of like this. And the question was, how did you get them to all start at the same point? That's sort of a uh, stock charts trick. So I will show you here, we tend to have charts that are in candlestick or open high, low, close bars or solid line. At the very bottom, you'll see things like cumulative and performance. And I love using this performance setting when you do that. It's gonna show you a, a, a whatever a ticker you use, you pick the starting point and it's gonna show you the performance, percentage performance from that starting point. Then at the bottom, you add these other indicators called price performance and just put the tickers, you can put a bunch of them on there. And that's how I created this chart uh, showing you these asset classes. Uh, if you missed what I just explained, you have no idea what I did. Uh, two things, just write our support test, they can help you do it. Or just shoot me an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. Let me know you want this asset allocation chart and I can email it right to uh, your login and you're done. You can use it that way. That's our mailbag for today. And again, those are all questions from you guys in the last day or two. We really appreciate you sending me your questions. Keep them coming uh, via email. We'll get to as many as we can. We need to wrap up our show and go right to the three and three. So three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for these different asset, uh, different cap tiers. We refer to this earlier uh, in our Wrap the Week segment, trying to make sense of this overall uh, environment. I think this is a really important chart to watch because now, you know, again, we all went from the world is ending mode into, you know, a couple days into this week, people are now thinking, all right, was that the bottom? For me, that's what tells me this is way too early. Bottoms don't, bottoms are not a day and they're not a week. They're a process. And that's one thing that I've certainly learned through a number of these sort of bear market cycles. So I would not be surprised if we get to a more viable level and, uh, with which you could ride the next uh, many legs higher. One of the ways I will try to make sense of that is using these cumulative advanced decline lines and looking for when we get a higher low in those cumulative advanced decline lines, I think will be really, uh, really helpful. One of our new contributors, by the way, Joe Duarte, who writes on our top advisors corner, does some really good work with those, uh, with those breadth rings. You might want to check uh, that out if you haven't already. Chart number two is looking at the U.S. versus the world. This is uh, the Spiders, SPY versus ACWI, All Country World Index, ACWI, which is an ETF that sort of covers global equities, half, about 50% U.S., about 50% uh, the rest of the world. So here we're looking at the U.S. versus everything. You know, is the U.S. outperforming or underperforming? Dollar weakness has certainly been a theme recently. It's sort of, uh, you know, stocks in the U.S. have rallied. The dollar has struggled. That's what's made it sort of uh, difficult, uh, sort of a disconnect from what we'd seen recently, I think the real question is going to next week, whether that trend continues. If it does continue lower, I think that's where you would expect further underperformance from U.S. versus non-U.S. stocks. Uh, that has implications for small cap versus large cap, a lot of other things coming down the way. However, this could be just a pullback within an uptrend, similar to what we saw at the end of February, uh, before the next leg of outperformance of U.S. stocks. But that's why it's chart number two that I'm going to be watching here. And chart number three is related to that. It's looking at the severe underperformance of uh, emerging markets. Uh, the question earlier that, that I had, thanks again for that on crude oil versus stocks. It's a really important one. And you've seen crude oil obviously come down significantly, maybe start to stabilize this week, but I, I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's at pretty extreme low levels, but things can remain. And oil in particular, if you look back over the history of oil, there have been times when it sells off and then just remains at a level, goes sideways for months and months. And, and all of a sudden it's not good. in an uptrend or a downtrend, it's in that annoying third option, which is a sideways trend. If that happens, if you continue to see lower oil prices, that's gonna hurt a lot of emerging markets. This trend is gonna continue down. And again, I'm always looking for things like this that I think people are unprepared for. Um, and if and when emerging markets start to really do well, broadly speaking, I think that's something that's gonna confuse a lot of uh, investors. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show and that's a week for the final bar. Thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us at the end of every trading day. Try to make sense of things from a technical perspective. Get your questions to us, the final bar at stockcharts.com. We'd love to hear from you. Also keep an eye on our YouTube channel. We have so much great content, including some really good specials like this week's Navigating a Bear Market special. So check out some of those previous shows. For stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. 
Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.